Hi everyone, my name is Pete McLean. I am a business advisor at Bright Red Triangle. Uh, Bright Red Triangle, we're here to help you start and run your own business, whether you're a student, graduate or alumni. So if you've got any business ideas, feel free to come and have a chat with us. Uh, we're here to help you. Uh, but today, uh, it gives me great pleasure to be talking to you about negotiating and influencing skills. Uh, hugely, hugely important area to concentrate on. I'm sure many of you have these skills already. Uh, so today, I'm going to try and give you some tips and tricks that will hopefully help you think about your negotiating skills and influencing, influencing skills and maybe refine them a little bit and get a bit better because uh, we can always be improving these two skills and uh, believe you me it will definitely come in handy uh, as you go through your career. So I'm sure many of you can think of lots of different examples uh, where you've uh, been in negotiation. You may, I would imagine, already had a negotiation this morning at some point um, and there's so, so many different levels of negotiation but actually it comes down to some core skills um, that you can think about. So some examples, you know, even this morning for me, I can think of a few examples of negotiating um, with my kids on uh, getting changed and ready for school. Uh, you might have already had some negotiations with your fellow students uh, as a team, as you're in groups on uh, trying to negotiate and influence people on your ideas and how that you might get them to adopt your ideas. Um, or negotiating uh, in the workplace uh, is hugely common. You might be negotiating at work at the moment for more hours or less hours or negotiating for more, for more pay uh, and influencing uh, your boss uh, to try and help, help you get a better position. Um, so negotiating is absolutely a core skill and the better you become at it, um, the more that you will get out of your personal life uh, and your uh, professional life. So what is a negotiation? I mean, there's there's a huge amount of definitions out there for negotiation. Um, here's a, the most simple one that I could find, was to have a formal discussion with someone in order to reach an agreement with them. So very, very simply put, um, you're, you're entering into some sort of discussion uh, and you're both trying to reach some sort of outcome, some sort of agreement. So, um, if you're really interested in the subject, there's a huge amount of literature and online material that you can go afterwards and investigate and read around and develop your skills. Um, but because we're trying to keep these videos short, um, today I'm going to concentrate on the Harvard model of negotiation. Uh, and that concentrates on four principles of negotiation. Now the first question I kind of asked myself was, you know, why principles uh, and not why Harvard model of negotiation and here are the four rules that you have to abide by. Um, and I think that brings up one of the most important points with negotiation is that um, negotiation is fluid. You know, um, if you have rules, um, it doesn't give you much flexibility uh, when negotiating. And then ultimately, if there's no flexibility when negotiating, quite often the negotiations will fail uh, and you will not reach an agreement or the outcome you're looking for. Whereas principles are really just giving you some guidelines to follow and it gives you the creativity uh, when negotiating to uh, be flexible and hopefully come out with a good outcome. So it's important just to have a look at what outcomes you can get from your negotiation. Uh, it may come across as fairly obvious but here are a few examples. Um, he, here's an example that you could um, be extremely friendly with the person that you're negotiating with. And that might be very um, common to your situation now at university. You're a group of friends, uh, a lot of time spent together being friends. Um, and when it comes down to doing some work and actually having your own opinions, it can be quite difficult to influence your other student uh, colleagues because you're pals with them um, and quite often that can uh, lead to bad negotiations um, because you know if you're friendly with someone and you like someone uh, you may you know give them a bit more leeway or not follow through on what you're actually wanting and so so actually they win the negotiations because you've um, been 
maybe too scared or don't want the awkwardness of, of challenging them. So that would be a lose-win situation. Or maybe um, you don't like someone, you, you know, you hate them, maybe, in fact, uh, and you go into negotiation. And that would be a win-lose situation in the fact that um, you they lose because you, you don't like them and you, you're taking a tough line. So there's, there's no mutual agreement there uh, to move forward. And obviously you have um, a compromise where you both uh, compromise on the situation. So you haven't actually got the outcome you're, either of you are looking for or you both lose-lose and there's no uh, outcome there for either of you and there's no agreement or a win-win, which is ultimately what we're trying to achieve here. But this highlights my very first principle here that um, try not to get personal um, and it's a very very hard one to manage and become good at because there's an element of personal in everything isn't there so my the principle one is to separate the person from the issue when you're going into a negotiation you're not trying to um, include feelings into the situation you're trying to remain removed from personal feelings and really focus on the task in hand and come to some sort of agreement. Um, I completely realise that um, this can be the hardest principle that I'm going to talk about today because a lot of um, people find it very difficult, including me, to disconnect the feelings you have for someone, whether you like them or you don't like them, and negotiate on the issue. And actually, I think, certainly for myself, I've got better at that over time. Uh, and I think that maybe comes with experience and uh, unfortunately maybe age. Um, but when you're having negotiations, I would tip one uh, from the Harvard principles of negotiation is to separate the person. So try and take your feelings for that individual personal feelings for that individual, whether you really like them in your pals or you hate them, um, try and remove that from the uh, situation that you're trying to negotiate. Principle two um, is to negotiate not on the position focused, but instead on uh, your interest orientated. And what do I mean by that? I've got a little bit of an example here, you're probably wondering why I've got a pumpkin in the background. Um, so as an example, three people wanted the pumpkin and they entered it into a negotiation um, and on investigating that kind of problem a bit more and asking the correct questions which we can cover in maybe another uh, episode of this um, is actually finding out what the parties are interested in because they actually in order to negotiate successfully they might all want something a bit different from this pumpkin so if you investigate a little bit further with these three people um, one person wanted the shell of the uh, pumpkin to uh, draw a, a mask for Halloween. Uh, another person wanted the flesh of the pumpkin to make some soup. And the third person maybe wanted the seeds of the pumpkin. So they all had completely different interests in this one single item. Um, and they could do a win-win negotiation because they could negotiate that they all took the various parts of the pumpkin. Uh, and everybody was happy. So that's just a bit of a very simple illustration of uh, finding out what the party's interests are and not just focusing um, on the sole individual item or problem. Um, so it's about finding out um, what the interested parties are looking for. Um, and ultimately the skill there you need is to listen. Uh, to listen to what people are wanting, asking uh, open questions. Um, finding out um, and listening to what their needs are and ultimately you may have different needs and can negotiate a win-win position. Principle three is to develop criteria for that solution must fulfill. So when you're negotiating it kind of piggybacks on principle two. Uh, it's very much about listening to the person you're negotiating with and finding out why they're here, why they're why are you negotiating with them? What is the outcome they're looking for? Um, and if you de develop a criteria um, that, that the solution must fulfill, uh, it opens up a completely new conversation um, and allows each other to absolutely understand um, what uh, the people are looking for. So again, just thinking 
off the top of my head, the, the kind of an example. Um, take uh, going out to a restaurant with your friends. Um, instead of um, not being very straight to the point, saying I want to, I don't know, I want to go to uh, McDonald's for dinner, that's it, um, end of story. Um, that doesn't give much flexibility for negotiation. Uh, it's a very closed uh, conversation. Whereas if we talk to the people in the room or the other people that are within the negotiation, you're asking open-ended questions to find out you know, what is it they're looking for. Um, it might be that, that if, if McDonald's was the type of thing they're looking for, they might be looking for something fast because you're looking to do something else. Um, they might be looking for something cheap because they don't have much money. And as soon as you develop criteria between the two of you that you're trying to fulfill, um, it opens up multiple options. So um, you might want to go to another fast food outlet because actually they're fast and they're cheap. So it really opens up the solutions that you can choose from. Um, and this is a very simple example, uh, but it's really about understanding what the other person is trying to fulfill. Uh, and if you get them on the table early, uh, it's much easier to negotiate your position and much easier to come to some sort of agreement. And the final principle we're going to talk about is to have options. Um, it's one of the best uh, skills that I think I've picked up over the years is that there's many options to a solution, especially in negotiation. And one of the clever things you can do here is have hopefully multiple options for the individual that you're talking to. Uh, and that allows them to feel that they're making the decision um, on the negotiation. Um, if you just give them one solution, they maybe feel a little bit backed into a corner. Uh, but if you have multiple options that you put forward to them, you give the power to them to therefore choose. And then that makes them feel that they're in control and they have chosen an option. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of the most powerful ones of the four principles. Um, but hopefully um, it will help you. And again, we're dusting over this subject extremely quickly. Uh, there's people out there that do dissertations, doctorates uh, on negotiation alone. So there's a lot of material there that we will uh, provide you with links, etc., cetera, um, to go forward. But next, we're going to have a quick look at um, some things to think about when influencing individuals. So we're going to talk about six shortcuts to influence. Uh, these little shortcuts will definitely help you uh, in your influencing journey. Um, so let's get started. So the six shortcuts that we're going to cover just now are reciprocity, scarcity, authority, consistency, liking and consensus. These are the six things uh, that should help your influencing skills. So reciprocity, um, it's not only hard to say, um, but it's, it's one of the ones that's most uh, uh, common. And what it means is uh, if you give something for, uh, for free or something a bit extra, uh, people like to give back. Uh, so the best way, I think, to explain this one is um, when you're out in a restaurant, uh, quite often when you ask for the bill, uh, a waiter or waitress will... Uh, give you the bill, but they'll also give you something a little, a little extra, whether that's a mint or um, whether that's uh, a, a, a liqueur or an extra beverage. At the end, um, a study found that the people uh, or the restaurants or the waiters and waitresses that did this actually found that um, their tips increased considerably uh, when they uh, gave a little bit extra. And we can use this to influence people as well. Um, it quite often comes up with the creatives that I work with. Should I be doing free work? Um, and th there's no easy answer to that. And each, each situation is different. But quite often by giving a little bit extra or giving something for free, um, you help people or influence people uh, to give back. So it's just a wee example there. The second one is scarcity. Um, it probably comes as no surprise. People want what they can't have. Um, and the, not only do you need to highlight the benefits uh, of your product and service um, when negotiating and influencing, um, people don't like to lose. So you have to highlight what they might lose if they don't um, 
either complete the sale or negotiation. Uh, and that's uh, really quite often why maybe in the digital space, when you're buying things or if you're in a sale, you'll often see a timer uh, on the screen and it's giving that sort of influencing you to purchase that product now um, uh, because it's going to run out or I might lose out on this uh, excellent deal if um, I don't close it in time or you might have gone to buy a car and they have said look I can do this deal today only if you come back tomorrow it's gone um, so scarcity um, is, is often used when trying to influence uh, someone in a negotiation authority um, we like to buy uh, from people uh, that have a credible, um, they're credible within their field. Um, so it's important to get that authority across. What makes you the expert? Um, for example, if we go into uh, the physiotherapists, you'll, you'll quite often see all their certificates on the wall, which is depicting um, that they have the authority to treat you. Uh, same with sort of accountants. Um, you know, it's it's. As you go through this process as well, some ways that you can build up your authority, and especially with uh, platforms like LinkedIn, um, which we actually have another session that Scylla, my colleague, is doing. Uh, the, the recommendations part of the LinkedIn process is hugely important and it helps stamp your authority, um, at, uh, why are you the expert to be sort of making the decisions, how, how can you influence people. Um, if you show that you have the knowledge base and come across as the expert, you have authority in that field. And getting recommendations on LinkedIn is very much um, a, a way to do that. Um, but also, if you're using social media as well, um, you can constantly um, get across to the other person or the people that you're trying to influence that you are the, the expert. Um, the small example there is um, with an estate agent. Um, the people, the, the receptionists that picked up the phone uh, when people were inquiring about properties, um, they just changed the language slightly and said, um, so if someone was inquiring about renting their property, the receptionist would say, um, uh, if you just hold on a second, I will um, pass you over to Susie. She's got 15 years experience in renting properties. Um, and then if someone was phoning to sell a house, they might be, uh, I'll just pass you over to Jim. He's got 20 years experience in selling properties in this area. And actually that estate agent uh, found that the appointments went up by 20% and the actual sales uh, commission that they got and closed sales went up 15%. And actually, if you think about that, um, that's at no extra cost to that business. There's the zero cost um, and they have increased sales. So uh, they're influencing the people that are phoning up to inquire. Consistency. Um, we, we like to do what we've done before, ultimately. Um, and the kind of example of this um, is uh, in dentists, uh, surgeries, um, or doctors, one of the biggest problems they have is people turning up for their appointments. Um, and what some doctors and, their, um, and dentist surgeries have done is actually have seen uh, an increase in people attending their appointments by actually getting the um, people uh, that attend the dentist surgeries to fill out their own appointments so that the receptionist will give them the card uh, and tell them the, the date and time of when they have to be there. And if they fill it in, you know, it's a little step from them and consistency to, to get them to attend that appointment. Or it's not maybe not just the first time you've had an interaction with that person that you're trying to influence. It's just slowly over time building up that relationship and having that consistency before you just go in for the big ask or the big sale. Um, it's just over time being consistent uh, and building up on that relationship. Liking, we all like to be liked, number five here. Um, so what, what makes us likable? You know, are you a likable person? Um, so ultimately things that make other people like you is if you have something in common, this was similar, um, you compliment someone. Um, so if you don't know the individual and you're trying to build up a bit of rapport, um, you, 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 you compl compliment them. Um, or you're sort of trying to cooperate, you know, you've got the same similar goals. Um, and, a, a, and an example of this is um, 
two groups were asked to um, come up with a solution uh, or, or negotiate. The first was told that um, time is money, like get straight into it, start negotiating uh, to try and get the outcome. Uh, and they had a 55% um, completion rate, success rate. Uh, and another uh, group was told, you know, just before you get down to business, let's just um, get to know each other, uh, tell each other a couple of things personally about each other, what you like, what you don't like, and ultimately build up a bit of rapport. And actually, the first group that just went straight into it and uh, hadn't got to know each other, and there was no small talk ultimately, um, had had a 55% success rate on the task. And the people that shared something personal before um, and ha had spent a bit of time getting to know each other and discuss things with each other had a 90% um, success rate on the task. So it's, 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 it's important um, to try and, again, listen uh, and, and find out what people like and, you know, what makes them smile. I always think if you create a, a smile when influencing people, you're definitely on the right track. And, and, and that certainly doesn't mean cracking uh, terrible jokes, um, but just spending not too long, but just a bit of time to break the ice, get to know each other. Uh, it'll have a huge impact on how you influence people. And finally, consensus. Um, it's a huge uh, influencing factor. People like to do what other people do. You know, it's, it's important to, you know, feel part of a group or feel sort of peer pressure, ultimately. Um, and uh, I managed to find a really good example online to, to get this point across. Um, so we, we often, when we go to hotels, um, Go, uh, and in the bathroom, there's a sign uh, up there to reuse towels uh, for sort of environmental reasons. Um, so if you're staying for a long period of time, can you re reuse your towels um, to help us out here? And normally there's about a 35% uptake on that just through the sign. Uh, and there was a small study done uh, about guests' behaviours. And actually over time, they found that about 75% of people over a longer stay will reuse their towels naturally in, in a, a hotel environment. So the hotel decided to um, put a sign up and say 75% uh, of people uh, reuse their towels over their stay. We would, we would like you to, to, to help us out and, and keep doing that. And the, the, the peer pressure, if you like, the, the pressure that that set that other, oh, well, other people do it. Uh, so a 26% increase um, on people reusing their towels, which was obviously in turn great for the environment and actually lowered the cost for the hotel. And then they actually went one step further and said, and made it even more personal and said, 75% uh, uh, of guests in this very room have reused their towels. And they, and they saw a 33% increase on people reusing their towels. So creating that feeling of um, other people have done it uh, has a huge impact on influencing people's behavior. So there are six things just to have a quick think about. Um, we're here um, to chat. So if you have any questions about what you've um, listened to today or want to take it in uh, take any more depth, uh, please feel free to get in touch with me personally or anyone at Bright Red Triangle or the Business School. Uh, we'd be more than happy to discuss it further. Uh, if you look at some of the resources we set out, um, you'll be able to dive into these topics a bit more in a bit more depth. But thanks very much for taking the time to listen uh, to me and I uh, hope to meet you all soon.